Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'll, we're going to wait uh, uh, about a minute or so uh, as the people begin to enter into the webinar, and we'll get started uh, as soon as we have a, a full house. Okay, I believe we can get started now. So good morning and uh, welcome to this webinar de dedicated entirely to the problem of plastics and sustainable packaging. My name is John Favaro uh, of, I am of Trust IT and the Horizon Results Booster. And uh, I will be moderating this webinar. So as we all know very well, uh, the introduction of plastics several decades ago uh, revolutionized packaging. And today, plastic is in fact the most widely used material for, for packaging. But plastics also now account for 3.4% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. And that's why bioplastics have become important. And so today we will hear presentations from the members of three European uh, research projects that have come together under the Horizon Results Booster to form the Bio for Plastics project cluster that covers the entire bioplastics value chain. So first we'll hear from Antonio Biondo of the Rewind project about the processing of organic waste. Then we'll hear from Eric de Vries of the UpBet project on the production of new bioplastics. And finally, we'll hear from Willem Utendale of the Preserve project on sustainable packaging. And this will all be followed by a panel discussion where we, we will also expect to have a chance to discuss broader policy related topics, uh, such as the relationship of this work to the European strategy for plastics in a, in a circular economy. So uh, um, a few housekeeping rules for, for the webinar. It is being recorded in its entirety uh, and a link to the full recording will be published on the, on the project uh, group members' websites. We'll give you all that information. All of the slides will also be available after the, uh, uh, after the webinar. So uh, please don't activate your microphone and videos unless the host uh, gives you permission to do so. You are welcome to ask questions. Uh, you can write them in the Q&A button. If you don't find it, then just write them in the chat. Ask them at any time. Uh, write them at any time that you want. Uh, we look forward to hearing your questions, so please uh, write them to us during the time they are speaking, uh, during the panel session, uh, whenever uh, you have questions. Please do so. We look forward to, uh, to answering your questions. And at this point, uh, uh, that's all from me for now. And so uh, let's go immediately to our first speaker, uh, who is Antonio Biondo from Rewind. Antonio, the floor is now yours. Thank you, John. Can you confirm that you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Just a second. Yes. Yeah, so hello everyone. My name is Antonio Biondo and I'm a, a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Bari in Italy. And today I will present uh, the project that was funded by the Horizon 2020 Maris Clodos Curie Action Individual Fellowship called the Rewind. So and our uh, main goal is to uh, uh, create, to use waste cooking oil as feedstock for polymer bioproduction. But of course, we have some sub goals, some uh, uh, goals that we want to achieve that are especially like the enzymatic recycling of waste cooking oils into polymers. And then the characterization of uh, these polymers for both like mechanical and biological to understand how they um, behave 
in certain environments and especially their biodegradation and biodegradability possibility. And then to identify uh, anticipatory LCA assessment to uh, calculate and to identify bottlenecks for the scale up approaches. Right now with, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, cooking oils are produced from uh, oleaginous crops uh, and we use them for human consumption or other kind of consumption and we produce waste cooking oils. And at the moment, these waste cooking oils are then transformed into biofuels. But we can valorize them to produce high value products that can go back to the human consumption. So polymers can be used, uh, can be also seen as high value products, especially because they are present in everyday life, especially bio-based polymers have an increasing market and biodegradable polymers can find application in different fields, especially to substitute other polymers that are not biodegradable and are not bio-based. However, when we, use, when we think about bio-based polymers, we think about virgin bio-based polymers. So polymers that are produced from virgin material. But these are uh, have drawbacks, especially over exploitation of soils and biodiversity loss. This is why we created this uh, new approach where we use uh, uh, waste cooking oils and that are uh, formed by triglycerides. So then we hydrolyze them to produce free fatty acids, then uh, to produce certain monomers. And then through processing and polymerization, we can produce polymers and especially we can have as byproducts uh, FAME, which, has, which are fatty acid methyl esters used as biodiesel. Our approach uses uh, uh, enzymes that are known to work in uh, water condition, also at low temperatures compared to other uh, um, catalysts, to other metal catalysts, and also they are very specific. So they produce less um, waste. And our enzyme of choice is this oleate hydratase, especially from uh, Elizabeth Kinja meningoseptica, which is a bacterium, but we use the recombinant enzyme from different hosts. So what we do, we use pre fatty acids from waste cooking oils to transform and to selectively uh, hydrate these uh, uh, unsaturated fatty acids that are present in the mixture to produce the monomers. And uh, what we do, we also optimize this reaction through design of experiments where we can identify specific conditions to improve the reaction be, um, uh, carried out by the enzyme. And as you can see in the graph on the um, up left, uh, up right, uh, you can see that the standard reaction, SR in gray, like there was already a very good oleic acid consumption, approximately 85%. But then with uh, through this approach of the design of experiments and of optimization, we were able to reach up to 98% of oleic acid consumption. Oleic acid is one of the main components of, of free fatty acids derived from waste cooking oils. So this was one of our uh, main topic to improve this, this part. But then what we could do is actually to increase and to optimize this, uh, this part by using two different enzymes. So one enzyme for the first hydrolysis, so to produce free fatty acids, as you can see in the first step, and then uh, the next step with hydration, as I showed before. And the enzyme that we used for hydrolysis is of course a lipase. Lipases are able to hydrolyze ester bonds in triglycerides, and then, they are able, and then the oleate hydratase can uh, hydrate specifically these uh, unsaturated fatty acids. And we carried all this uh, process in one pot. So together, lipases and uh, oleatoidotases can work together for the production of the monomers. And we could see that with the optimized reaction conditions that we carried out through a uh, design of experiments, we were able to increase up to 40% 40, 40 more of oleic acid consumption. Of, of course, like these uh, uh, monomers, we want them to, um, to create the polymers itself. So we carried out the processing and, and purification of the monomer. And we were able to produce FAME, so these fatty acid methyl esters for biodiesel, and the monomer itself, which is the 10 hydroxystearic acid methyl ester. And then we were able to polymerize all of these uh, with a total yield 
from the waste cooking oil to the aliphatic polyester of approximately 30%. We are also improving and reaching the market with a newly founded startup that is called Rewow, where we can identify specific markets and high value markets for these aliphatic polyesters. The take home message that I would like to share with you is, of course, like bioproduction of polymers from waste cooking oils is important and is, is, it can be possible. Design of experiments is an important tool for the optimization of bioprocesses. And of course, so like biodegradation and LCA are important and we are still working on it. I would like to uh, thank, of course, the University of Bari and the Laboratory of Microbial Biotechnology from uh, Dr. Isabella Pisano and Professor General Grimi, but of course, all the other people working with me and uh, the different uh, collaborations from uh, different uh, universities. So University of Stuttgart, KTH in Stockholm and University of Groningen, where we are carrying all the biodegradability and LCA analysis. And thank you for your attention. And thank you very much, Antonina, for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, uh, I would like to remind the participants that we are looking forward to, uh, to receiving your questions for our speakers. I do happen to have a question for you, Antonino. Uh, uh, waste cooking oils are, are clearly currently being used for the production of biofuels. How, how can this technology compete with the current scenario? Definitely. Like this is uh, very, very important also because we are not, uh, uh, we are still at the lab scale. So this is uh, something important to identify also technical economic analysis and uh, um, different approaches for reducing the cost to reach also competitive cost uh, uh, of production for our, our polymers. However, what, we, what I showed also during uh, in, the, in the slides, we don't produce only polymers, but we produce also biodiesel that can also be used, can still be used as biofuel. So there can be a synergistic effect. So creating high value products together with biofuels that can be used for specific applications. So there will be for sure uh, an interesting uh, synergistic effect and also uh, collaboration with different companies that are working in the field. So I imagine that one of the, the themes of, uh, of these presentations will be the synergies that can be created with other uh, uh, initiatives that are going on. Do I understand that correctly? Exactly, exactly. Okay, very good. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Antonino. And now we move immediately to our next speaker, who is Eric de Vries uh, from the UPET project. And uh, Eric, the, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, All right. Uh, Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, whenever you see this uh, re recording. Um, please confirm if you can see my uh, my screen. Yes, but it is not yet the uh, the full screen. There we go. Presentation mode. Now it should be. Uh, getting close. Yes. Ah, all right. You're up. Fine. So what? Uh, uh, thank you, John, for the introduction. What I would like to discuss in today's webinar is. Basically, the use of biotechnology to upcycle plastic wastes into new bioplastics. And so this is an all-encompassing uh, enzymatic and, and strain engineering approach to dealing with uh, a really big problem that the world has, right, in all these uh, plastic wastes. So a brief introduction about myself. I'm Eric de Vries. You can find me on LinkedIn. As you can see here, I'm the CEO of Enzymicals. Uh, I have a career in biotech for more than 20 years, and I've worked with a couple of renowned biotech uh, companies in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I now landed in Greifswald, Germany, where I head up Enzymicals AG, which is a, a biotech firm that develops biocatalytic processes, mainly for pharma and fine chemicals. However, we do enzyme discovery and optimization, and uh, that is also part of our contributions to the APET uh, program that I want to uh, discuss today. So what is APET? APET stands for upcycling of uh, polyethylene and polyethylene terephthalate waste uh, uh, into bioplastics and uh, specifically polyhydroxybutyrate valerate uh, PHPV bioplastics. And the approach of APET is to take basically diversity in nature, 
that we find in databases or actually in soil samples or in cell collections to use that as a source to find novel biocatalysts, enzymes that can degrade PET uh, and, and polyethylene. And in this little picture here, you can see the, the model of the enzyme with its active site, and you see the strand of uh, polymer uh, going through and being hydrolyzed. So this uh, is uh, what's called biocatalysis, and uh, our goal is to find new enzymes to go protein, protein engineering to make better enzymes, potentially use enzyme cascades uh, to come to a very efficient, complete breakdown of, of polymers, do process development, figure out how to isolate the products, right, and then make everything more efficient in, in, in a cycle of a design, test, build, and learn. Um, the monomers that we achieve from PET are uh, ethylene glycol and terephthalic acid, uh, EG and TPA. And what we expect from the degradation of polyethylene are aliphatic molecules with some functionality. These products then are either polymerized into a green solvent or are used in follow on uh, uh, fermentation steps to create uh, biomass and then ultimately create PHBV. So what you see here is, is that follow on step where uh, these organic chemical molecules basically coming out of the degradation of the plastic serve as a feedstock for a renewed fermentation with, with uh, some type of organism that can grow on these, uh, these kinds of compounds. So from that, we get biomass. We, uh, we're working in a big project that also invo involves um, lollipop manufacturers, so uh, uh, food industry, uh, meat packaging, cookie packaging, etc. So in our uh, project, there are also industries that have sugar-rich industry wastes, and that will also be put in these fermentations. So from that, we, uh, we do uh, microorganism-based strategies to PHBV. So a brief overview of some results. So typically what it looks like is we take PET bottles, we, uh, we grind them up, and uh, we make sure that we have small pieces because that favors a fast enzymatic conversion. Then we add the enzyme, in this case, the PET degrading enzyme. And these are known. Many, many groups in the world are looking for PET degrading enzymes, and very successfully so. In our labs, we've scaled this in a, a decent size reactor of 10 liters, where we can do 150 grams, 200 grams of PET conversion all the way down to terephthalic acid. And this is the structure of the of terephthalic acid. We then feed the terephthalic acid to a, a, a bacterium called Comamonas that can grow on this type of molecule. And so we have a really very big fat growth of, of, of organism. And we can see, for instance, here in those fermentations that the level of terephthalic acid goes down over time. So we have evidence that the, also the growth is due to the terephthalic acid that is present. And then we feed that whole soup to a organism that actually, when it is under stress, it produces bioplastics. And uh, so, as you can see here, and I will have another picture later, this is a cell, this round, uh, round thing that you see in the picture with all these little other round balls in it. So this is a cell that is full of little particles of bioplastic. So what we see, what we see is that uh, um, we create problems for nature and nature responds to it. And what I, I'm always surprised by how relatively easy it is for us to go into nature and to find parts of the solution of the problems that man created. And so if you follow the news on plastic degradation a little bit, you see newspaper articles, scientific articles, where people describe, for instance, uh, a little uh, wax worm that can eat a plastic bag. And in this picture, you see the, the worms and you see the holes in the plastic bag. And the worm can do that because it has enzymes, right? 
What we find on, on PET is that, uh, for instance, a really good PET converting enzyme from Ideal was found in a soil sample from a PET recycling facility. So apparently waste ends up in a little bit in the environment and the environment response. The best known enzyme uh, currently for converting PET is called uh, LCC. Uh, it is used by a French company called Carbios, and they are scaling this process to 50,000 tons of PET per year. So really industrial, full, full industrial scale. It was identified in compost heap. You can imagine plastic waste ends up in nature. It gets collected. It ends up in a compost heap. These are enzymes are there or are generated by the microorganisms to respond to challenges in nature. And actually, if you believe this paper, uh, you already in your mouth might have a PET converting hydrolase because one uh, research group found a hydrolase in human saliva metagenome. So uh, your, the, problem, the solution to the problem might be closer to home than you think. So now a little bit about this PHBV cre creating organism. Again, we are uh, working in a conglomerate of uh, European partners, and one of them is a Spanish partner uh, called uh, CTAC, and also the University of Alicante is working on, on this project. And so very close to that university, there is a salt pond, and they find organisms that really grow in very high salt concentrations. And this is the organism that we now want to optimize for making even more of these little plastic PHBB balls, the bioplastic. And uh, uh, you can treat uh, uh, or ferment this so-called Haloferax organism on different uh, feedstocks. Uh, in this case, in this table is some vinash, which is a degradation product of uh, biomass or uh, a whey protein. And it'll grow, and depending on what you feed it, it can make uh, varying ratios of the, the, the two different monomers that make up hydroxy uh, uh, polyesters, so hydroxybutyrate or hydroxyvalerate. And so now, by being able to fine tune what what the organism produces by what type of stuff you feed it, we can generate bioplastics that have different properties. So that is a brief introduction to, uh, to our project. Uh, I want to have uh, three uh, take home messages for you to, uh, to uh, never forget, right? Is that first enzymatic degradation of plastic waste is certainly possible. And we, we show, uh, showed an example of PET conversion. Uh, polyethylene is more challenging, but there are also more examples of polylactic acid, nylons, the polyurethanes. So all of these, technologies will mature in the near future. There are different ways to upcycle the degradation products. In our UPAT case, we use fermentation-based processes, which give some advantages, we feel. And so these uh, bio-based plastics offer good properties, but currently the, 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 the samples that are on the markets are still relatively expensive. And we hope that with the uh, conclusion of our project is that when we can use plastic waste as an input, that's the cheapest material you can get basically, maybe then we can uh, achieve the required cost advantage. Um, so that was uh, my, uh, my introduction of APET. And so thank you for your attention. And John, I, I think maybe there are one or two questions. So I'm happy to answer that. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll stop sharing my screen. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Eric. Uh, I think the phrase nature saves nature has some interesting philosophical implication for yeah. mankind, too. Uh, uh, but um, I'd like to address two points you brought up in your in your takeaways. Uh, first, of course, it, it very much at the center of your presentation were enzymes, and in fact, also uh, an enzymic approach also in, in the rewind that Antonina talked about. Yeah. And you talked about how plastic waste could save us, uh, so to speak, or make, make it cost effective, so to speak. But enzymes are, are known to be very selective. So can they really deal with a mixture of unsorted and possibly contaminated plastic waste like you are uh, proposing? 
Uh, that's an interesting question, John. I, I think so. Yes, that is what people know about enzymes, right? That enzymes are highly specific and can achieve types of chemistry that uh, normal organic chemistry cannot, right? Um, uh, enzyme specificity and selectivity is really important. If you want to make one specific molecule, let's say for the pharma industry, where it needs to be ultra pure. However, there are many enzymes that are really not great enzymes and that have a rather sloppy substrate uh, acceptance profile or a variety of molecules and they can convert it, right? So we, we tend to use those poor enzymes for projects like this, where for, for instance, we don't care how long a PET chain is, it, 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 the, the end is always the same, right? And so I, the, the, the whole concept is that if you feed enzymes like this, different feedstocks, it'll either do something or it will not do something. Uh, so the PET in a, in a mixed plastic stream will be converted, polyethylene just stays, and you can then use that in a follow-on step with maybe a different enzyme. Okay. Or you can do like Antonino just uh, presented, a one pot system where you have maybe multiple enzymes together, one taking care of this, the other taking care of that. So there are multiple strategies possible for, uh, for navigating the, uh, uh, the labyrinth of, of the different uh, kinds of enzymes. And as you can imagine, that leads to a lot of optimization work. <laughs> yes, I can <laughs> very well imagine. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thank you very much, Eric. I look forward to talking to you also in the panel, of course. Um, Absolutely. And, thank oh, you. we do have a question here. So let's say, all right. So I have a question for you uh, right away, Eric, that came from, uh, from uh, Valentina, it seems. Uh, are you using or envision the use of microreactors for, for example, transferring polymers or uh, in monomers or using microorganisms? So, so um, you have to remember that the material that we get is a, a very insoluble plastic. It is designed not to be soluble in water. Otherwise, it would just uh, dissolve in the oceans. And you know, everybody knows microplastics persist, right? And end up in the entire environment. So that type of material limits the type of reactions we can do. So yes, there are uh, uh, multi-parallel small reactors that are very popular in scaling up processes. In our case, I envision a big, big tank where you put in all that plastic and you put in the enzyme and you try to stir it and that, that might be a challenge in and of itself. So we're not looking at miniaturizing this. The same type of considerations we have is when you have a heterogeneous substrate in your fermenter in the case of whole cell conversions, right? It's a solid particle. And then the cell basically can also be regarded as a solid particle. It has a cell wall around it. Uh, I don't see the two mixing and interacting at the, at the level that is required to achieve a fast and economic degradation. So then you have to go for a microorganism that secretes these enzymes. So they have the cell, the enzyme goes out, the, en the enzyme then is in the bulk liquid and then the plastic material comes in. That concept may work. And for instance, I think the, the LCC enzyme that I briefly mentioned for carbios is one of these cutinases that is secreted from a host organism. So that concept will work. I would put it in as big a fermenter as I can get my hands on. All right, very good. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, actually, quite a few questions are now rolling in. We'll stop. Uh, uh, We'll stop this now, right now. Eric, you can take a look uh, uh, in the Q and A and, uh, as, as yes, and uh, <laughs> either answer them writing the uh, the answers to the questions, or I we see. can address them during the panel discussion. Yes, I see some familiar names already. So <laughs> well, there you are. It's, it's nice to <laughs> I'm see sure some you'll have your hands full for a few minutes now. <laughs> well, I'll uh, get so, going on it. All, all right, right, great. Uh, so uh, now I'll pass on to our last uh, speaker, uh, who is. Uh, um, Willem uh, Utendale uh, from the, the Preserve Project. And Willem, the floor is now yours. Uh, let's get your screens up, uh, your, your slides up on the screen. Perfect. Yes, thank you. Uh, all clear. All right. Thanks very much. 
All right, thank you. I hope everyone can see my screen uh, properly. Yes, um, I can. All right, so I will give an, a short overview on the Preserve project, which is on sustainable packaging uh, with tailored end of life. Um, before I start, a little bit about myself and about Centex Bell. So I'm Willem Uitendale. I'm a researcher at Centex Bell, which is a collective research and technical center located in Belgium. Um, and focused on textiles and plastics. Um, we are well equipped with different testing laboratories and, and pilot platforms uh, for different types of trials and certification, like for example, the COVID uh, mouth masks uh, we all come to, come to know. Then a bit more on the, the Preserve project. So I will start giving talking about the, the goal of the project, then go over some of the activities and then end up with some take home uh, messages. So the, the start of the, the Preserve project was kind of that there is a need for high performance bio-based packaging if we want to meet um, the European sustainability goals. So it doesn't need, just need to be bio-based. It also really needs to be high performing and viable. And the way we want to do this is, on the one hand, we want to enhance bio-based packaging, um, their properties and their recyclability to make sure that they are high performance and um, sustainable. Look and see how, how we can recover and reintroduce the different biopolymers that we used in our packaging. And then also at the end of life, um, see if we can upcycle these materials into different non-food uh, applications to extend once again the lifetime of these materials. So concretely, this translates into a few demonstrators. So the food-based demonstrators are based on bio-based and recyclable food packaging. And some examples here are, for example, a, a snack flow pack um, or, for example, some different types of cups. Um, and then once these materials cannot be recycled anymore, we look at into upcycling them into different types of non-food um, demonstrators, such as, for example, carrier boxes or injected jars uh, for all kinds of uh, applications. This, of course, is a, a project that we are not doing ourselves. There is a whole heap of partners here working to accomplish the goals of this project, and it's coordinated by uh, Iris Technology uh, Solutions. So then some of the highlighted activities of this project. So the first one I'm going to talk about is about plastic multilayers. And here the idea is how can we switch to bio-based multilayer packaging? Because we of course need multilayer packaging to achieve uh, sufficient properties. Then secondly, can we also switch to uh, bio-based, then mainly PHA, barrier coatings for paper-based uh, materials, such as, for example, cups, beverage bricks, uh, and so on. And how do we ensure the recyclability of all these kinds of relatively complex uh, materials? So when we talk about some of the multilayer packaging, here the focus is on, on the one hand PLA and on the one hand bio-PET packaging where we will apply protein coatings um, to improve the oxygen transmission rate, which is quite important to keep the food um, properly maintained. Um, and this protein coating also acts as a material that can be used to ease the separation of different layers. So at the end of the life, the protein coating can be easily removed, which allows all the different layers to separate uh, relatively easily. In case we don't obtain sufficient properties with the protein coating, we also have the option to apply a metallization layer on top of either the protein coating or on top of the PLA or the bio uh, itself. And then, of course, since we have quite a lot of different materials here, different layers, it's also important to have a proper adhesive to make sure that all these layers stay together during the lifetime. And for this, um, we are developing different types of bio-PU and protein-based hot melts um, to make sure that all the different layers uh, stick together. Then the second um, developments we're doing regarding coating um, and barrier properties is more focused on the paper. 
Um, and here we're using PHA, which, as Eric mentioned, is a biopolymer uh, produced by bacteria. And we're applying this PHA on the one hand via extrusion coating, um, and on the other hand, also via a wet coating process, um, which then allows us to improve the, the barrier properties of this paper and improve the durability, allowing us to reach a water vapor transmission rate of 17 grams per square meter uh, per day currently. But then, of course, we have these different kinds of materials. As I mentioned, we are using protein coatings to make sure that we can separate these kind of layers. But of course, that's not the, the only step in the recycling process. We are also making sure and verifying that we can sort these different types of materials automatically so that if we have, for example, a protein coated material or a PHA going into an automatic sorting facility that they can easily detect, yes, this is a PHA or yes, this is a protein based material. We're also looking into optimizing the different layer separation so that we can separate, for example, the PHA from the paper or the, the PET and the PLA um, from, the, from the adhesion layer. When we're talking about paper, we're also investigating the repulpability. And when we look into to bio based materials, we're also looking into the compostability of these materials, um, especially for PLA, then looking how we can improve the compostability. Because as most of you might know, PLA is um, industrially compostable, but with the inclusion of some additives provided by Carbiolis, um, we can accelerate this uh, compostability. And then finally, the final way to recycle the materials is to also upcycle um, different blends of materials together into new um, materials with improved uh, properties. And an example of this uh, upcycling is using microfibular reinforcement. So what we do here is we take a, bl a blend of uh, polyethylene and polyamide um, so this can come out of, for example, an, a recycling process where we were not able to, for example, fully separate these materials and we are processing them together um, in order to create a new foil. And by optimizing the extrusion process, we're able to generate, as what you can see in the images, uh, some microfibular structures where you have a bulk of polyethylene and microfibrils of polyamide inside of this bulk material. The creation of these microfibrils actually improves the properties of the bulk polyethylene. So the modulus increases by 10 to 25% and the tensile strength can increase uh, up to 10 or even 100% um, by blending these materials and using the right uh, additives. These films can then also be further improved regarding their oxygen and water vapor transmission rates by using an e-beam treatment to further reduce these transmission rates by 10 to 15 percent. So really upcycling these different blends of materials uh, into a new material with improved properties. So then some take home messages. So for example, for, first of all, I would like to say that it's clearly viable to use different types of biopolymers um, as multi-layer packaging. Then secondly, PHA also shows some new potential um, as a barrier coating for food uh, applications. It's not sufficient yet, but we are getting uh, quite close. Then also blends of recycled PLA um, or blends of recycled PLA with recycled polyamide can be self-reinforced to make sure that their properties are actually improved compared to the original uh, bulk material. And upscaling of all these different processes is uh, currently ongoing. And before I end my talk, I would also like to, to say that if you want to stay up to date with the Preserve project and with the developments that are ongoing, then feel free to go to our website and especially to the contact section um, to make sure that you subscribe to the to the newsletter. So with that, I will close my talk. So thank you for your attention. If there are any questions, then feel free to ask them in the chat or uh, send me an email. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Willem, for this. Uh, I do have a question. Can you go back to uh, the, the, the concept of separation, say more about how can the laminates be separated for the upcycling of materials. 
Yes, indeed. So the, the separation of, of laminates is usually quite difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and this is actually why we have this protein layer as part of the multi-layer structure. Um, so on one hand, it provides barrier properties, but on the other hand, once the material is shredded, um, it's a layer that can relatively easily be removed, um, allowing the materials that are attached to them to, um, to separate out. Uh, and another quick question. How are you testing your secondary raw materials? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? How are you testing the secondary raw materials? Um, so the way we are testing these uh, secondary raw materials um, is, of course, because they are for non-food applications. We don't have to do any food-related uh, testing anymore. Um, but we test them mainly for their tensile strength. We test them for some contaminants that could be in there. Um, after the recycling process. Um, and then also, uh, once again, the barrier properties that should be there even for, uh, for non-food applications. I see. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Willem. Uh, okay. At this point, uh, <clears throat> we come to our panel discussion uh, where I would like now to ask uh, all of our speakers and all of our panelists, let's say, to turn on their uh, uh, videos. So uh, our speakers, our three speakers, of course, will be joined also by Estella and Fuensanta, uh, um, uh, uh, who will be able also to uh, answer some, some broader questions that we would also like to bring into, uh, uh, into the discussion. And in fact, maybe I would like to actually start with those broader questions, which might actually frame the discussion uh, afterwards. Um, uh, it has been talked about uh, briefly in a couple of the talks about uh, about constraints from the directives that are coming down from the uh, from the uh, the European uh, Commission, the directives on waste and end of waste status, uh, uh, th this sort of thing. What is the status? What are the criteria there? I think Fuen Santa, I think you have been looking at this. Can you can you fill us in and set some context for us? Yes. Well, um, after talking with different industries, they see uh, a barrier when it comes to use this uh, waste as uh, byproducts or feedstocks feed uh, feed for, their, for their processes, because they need to become uh, waste managers. And this is something that is out of their business. So uh, the only way of using a waste as a byproduct, as a secondary raw material, is uh, uh, making it um, uh, and end of waste, uh, making it uh, not a waste, but transforming it into a, a secondary raw material. Uh, that uh, needs of a specific criteria that uh, that come from regulations. And at the moment, I know that at European level there are uh, two regulations. Um, specifying the criteria for certain types of waste. I think it, it is glass and metal waste, but I know that the European Commission is working also on establishing criteria for uh, plastic waste, for rubber uh, from tires. And uh, for example, at national level, uh, there is a work to be done also. In Spain, we have six uh, regulations that are um, specifying and, uh, this, and deciding uh, which are the criteria for, um, I think it is, um, for example, uh, cooking oil. Uh, there is a, a specific regulation for, for cooking oil. So what I want to highlight it is that it is necessary to work on establishing this kind of uh, end of waste criteria to be able to uh, implement these uh, circular solutions and to facilitate that a waste in one process can become a secondary raw material in, in another process, in another industry, in a way that uh, the industry don't need to go through long uh, processes, long um, a certification, uh, that they need to be authorized to, to manage this kind of waste. Mm -hmm. uh, Stella, would you like to add some comments to that? I believe you've been working in the same area. 
Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, Santanta um, summarized a much more in concrete uh, what the, the, some of the challenges there are. I have more of a even broader perspective uh, since um, I, in Preserve, uh, I work for European Bioplastics and we represent the, the industry of bioplastics. Uh, and we monitor very closely the whole policy um, frameworks and initiatives and proposals. And this, uh, there is a lot of work going on at the European level right now um everything that we have discussed today has to do with uh, on the one hand with the eu plastic strategy of course because bioplastics are fit into this category um and if in in this uh, regard there has been also a regulation last year on recycled plastics intended for food contact material um and uh, right now there is even mm -hmm. a revision going on so this is this is bringing a lot of changes. Uh, probably the revision on food contact materials um, will happen is happening right now. Should come in 2023. Let's say uh, let, let's see when it comes uh, in the end. And on the other hand, we have of course the EU Green Deal, which is which is why we're here. Basically, all these projects. This is the the, the ambitions that the European Union has to have a. A circular economy to reduce waste uh, and to uh, become carbon neutral. And of course, within this, we have the the circular economy action plan. As you all know, we all know this probably uh, that came in 2020. And within this comes the waste framework directive re revision. Of course, um, that Constanta was uh, talking uh, more concretely about. And also, we have other um, regulations. Um, for example, the packaging packaging waste regulation proposal that the European Commission proposed last November, uh, that will also affect um, the, the the end of so it, it affects from the from the outset the design uh, of any product that is uh, bio bioplastic bio based or biodegradable. Uh, the end thinking already on uh, in the end of life, and that's what we're doing. For example, in preserve uh, from the outset. Uh, this we are taking already into account. And of course, we have this policy framework on bio-based, um, biodegradable and compostable plastics that the commission also published. So there is a lot going on. There is, uh, uh, we have identified many challenges, uh, very concrete as when Santa said on, well, very concrete things. Some, someone has to become a waste manager to be able to actually achieve these goals that the European Union has set for itself. So there are some uh, inconsistencies, um, but of course, uh, I think that at the end of the day, we all are aiming at the same goals. And it's a matter of fine tuning all these big um, proposals, all these big leg legislations, and then going into the nitty gritty of the details of these more concrete proposals. And uh, mm -hmm. that's what all we're all doing also up at and, and Preserve and, and Antonin and Rewind, we are looking at also, how can we actually inform decision makers to facilitate what we're doing to achieve our common goals? Indeed, indeed. I, we do have a specific question from uh, Luis Fonseca uh, uh, for for you or or whoever knows uh, to ask. Would like to clarify if there is a specific regulation to the use of agri food processing bio waste residues. Um, is there, um, does somebody have information on this? Maybe I can take over, especially for uh, waste cooking oil. Like, I can imagine, yes, of course. Yes, so <laughs> in that case, like we also like what so what we use as feedstock is not so waste cooking oil directly from restaurants or from households, but it's actually a regenerated uh, used cooking oil that is called the RUCO. So this regenerated uh, used cooking oil, as a friend Santa also mentioned, is uh, a, um, a byproduct or secondary raw material that it can be used, especially for uh, the biofuel uh, production. So it is. There are already some regulations to eliminate, especially like food residues and also amount of humidity and other free fatty acids, so acidity, to make sure that the biodiesel or biofuel production is completely standardized. So there are already, especially because as. Um, when Santa and uh, Estella mentioned, is that. Uh, um, 
I mean, there are waste management companies and the transformation companies. So the, the transformation companies cannot also be uh, the um, waste managers. So there needs to be a specific value chain for the final product and especially for the valorization. And this will increase the industrial symbiosis approaches for different uh, um, for different residues. So this is one residue for uh, bio-based uh, residue waste or byproduct, uh, but every um, product, especially if it's uh, um, domestic, so household or muni municipal, urban or industrial has a specific uh, code for waste that then needs to be uh, transformed into a byproduct to then be used in another value chain. But this is uh, quite common and uh, uh, there needs to be, a, of course, as Estella said, an improvement also at the European regulations. All right, continuing on this theme of, uh, of, of the effect that the directives are having on you, uh, Will, Willem, I'd like to ask you, uh, are these like end of waste criteria are, are they limiting the implementation of these upcycling technologies? Are you feeling the effects of these? Um, for um, for the upcycling of the, these materials, um, it's quite difficult to tell uh, for me at the moment, um, especially because we are still doing quite a lot of, of developments here on, on small scale. Um, but some of the effects of these regulations can indeed be, be felt. Um, for example, with the, the limitations on combinations of paper-based packaging and, and the, the plastic-based barrier layers. Um, so there are limitations there to ensure that the material is recyclable in, in paper mills. And for example, that we aren't, um, that, that you don't sell uh, uh, material that is theoretically paper-based that maybe only contains 30% paper. Um, Understood. So in that way, there are, are some indeed limitations. If, if I can add, add one more comment on this, I think uh, so we're developing technologies, right? We're developing novel technologies, novel products, novel ways of dealing with waste streams, etc. I think one way to achieve uh, changes in policies is to give them a solution, right? You can complain about something you don't, you don't like a policy, but if you have no alternative, then nothing will change. So I think this will also be a lot of technology push. And with the realization that the policy change might actually take longer than the actual development of a process or the construction of a full scale plan. Huh? Uh, that is the sad state of affairs in, in politics. Uh, I'm afraid so. And that's true probably in any domain <laughs> that uh... That the technological uh, improvement outraces the uh, uh, the policy development. Uh, uh, so be it. I do. I would like to continue with you, Eric, uh, on a quick question, uh, a quick provocative question. Do all of these great new technologies produce waste themselves <laughs> that have to be managed somehow? They they certainly have their own byproducts. So so from that point of view, yes, of course, every process has a certain amount of waste. However, coming back to uh, my, my comment about nature saves nature, if you truly look closely enough in nature, there is absolutely no waste in nature, right? If there were waste in nature, we would be up to here in something, right? <laughs> and so I, I think when we are looking for biotechnological solutions to the problems, the types of waste that we create are not causing a problem. You, you might create uh, biomass, but you can treat that in wastewater treatment facilities. We're not introducing foreign materials like uh, transition metals or, or any other things like that. So what the waste that we create are relatively benign. Some of the waste that we create when we ferment might be like CO2, right? When you brew beer, it bubbles. We like it when we drink it, but not when it's in the atmosphere. So there are certain types of waste that are a little bit more difficult to deal with. However, if you compare it to uh, the other types of waste that other industries, polymer industries create, especially at the end of life, that's a lot of CO2 when it gets incinerated. Huh? So uh, again, I think we, we're, we need to be aware of these things, right? So when in our pro project, we look at all these potential waste streams and see how we can loop them back, right? Can we, uh, for instance, 
maybe not all plastic material is degraded by our enzymes. That is fine. We take that reject, we make a little Lego brick out of it, and we can build homes. Uh, one of our partners actually, and don't, don't laugh, but actually makes speedboats out of the plastic waste, right? So there are other applications to, to postpone the end of life, at least for a while. And I prefer the plastic to be in a speedboat than floating as a microparticle in the ocean. Well, well said. Uh, Antonino, uh, Willem, would you like to add anything to this uh, uh, for with, uh, what has to do with your own processing? Yeah, definitely. Like uh, the, there are different approaches. I mean, for example, the biodiesel it can be like one approach for dealing with the, with the waste, especially because waste cooking oil, if it's not properly collected, it can be a huge problem like microplastics. So there can be it can be floating on drinking water or on groundwater. So this can be a huge problem for uh, save water as well. So for sure, like one of the innovative uh, or anyway with the high scale uh, production is the biodiesel or biofuels in general. But uh, there will be also like, uh, I mean, uh, historically, uh, waste cooking oil has been used also to produce soap or detergents. So there is also uh, there are always alternatives to postpone the end of life, as uh, um, as uh, Eric said. But of course, uh, there needs to be also a high value uh, for the value chain. There needs to be an increase of uh, interest. That I mean, if we talk about sustainability at the 360 degrees, we need to talk also about uh, environmental, economic, and social sustainability. So there needs to be a uh, increase of value that can go into the value chain to improve, for example, collection of waste cooking oil. So then it can be uh, collected and save more water, for example, or other products. And with this, uh, uh, I mean, what I showed as well, uh, like instead of using different virgin raw material, bio-based bio, bio virgin raw material, or other kind of fossil um, raw material, we could use this waste cooking oil as feedstock for polymers. So there is for sure an interesting part, but of course there are different approaches that to, to solve one specific problem or for always there are different solutions. Uh, thanks very much, Antonina. Uh, Willem, a comment? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for us as well in the in the preserve project, the the treatment and the, the reduction of the waste is, is very important. Mm -hmm. And this is also why such a big portion of the of the project is focused on how can we separate these relatively complex materials into different parts that can easily be reused, recycled, and so on. Um, and how can we, once they are no longer recyclable, um, still try to upcycle them for different kinds of applications? How can we improve the biodegradation of some of these materials to also uh, look into, into those kinds of end-of-life applications? Um, but in the end here for these kind of food packagings where relatively high properties are, are required, um, it's a difficult task. Um, but I think when in the preserve project, we're doing good work into, uh, into looking how we can recycle these materials uh, multiple times. Excellent. Very, uh, thanks very much, Willem. Uh, I'd like to, uh, we're coming up to the close. Uh, I would like to finish with a, a question that we have received from the participants, maybe looking towards the future. Are there any novel technologies or projects going on with medical device sustainable packaging? Does anybody have information on that? And if not, then there's something for us in the future. <laughs> so, <laughs> as, yeah, as far as I know, uh, personally, we don't have any projects indeed for medical devices. Um, yes. But at least for the preserve projects, one of the partners is also active in, in medical device packaging. So I assume they are at least keeping a, keeping an eye on those possibilities. Fantastic. So <laughs> very good to know that we're also looking towards the future. Now, I hope that you can see my screen now. I, I believe that I have shared it. I would like to thank all of you uh, participants for, uh, for, for being here and being very active with your questions. Uh, once again, 
uh, this has been recorded and the, all of the presentations will be available and they will be in ma made available on the websites of our partners who have presented uh, today. So, so please get in touch with them for, for everything. I can tell that already that some of you know uh, each other very well. <laughs> I saw some very uh, uh, delightful discussions going on during, and that's also very good to keep the community together and to growing. Uh, so from my part, I would like to say thank all of the speakers and all of the panelists. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you sometime in the future. All the best and have a great day, everybody. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.